hello friends and family on Facebook and YouTube. Good to see you this morning. It's a beautiful day to be in the Lord's house. Uh, you got a few minutes before we start. If you're close to the east side of Wichita, come on over to 11801 and join us. 11801 East Lincoln Street. Uh, this morning we'll be in the book of Acts chapter 21, teaching through the book of Acts. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, being a bridge to hope or a tripping hazard as a Christian. Uh, looking forward to a great morning. Uh, come on, sing with us. If you're there at home or driving around right now, grab your Bible, grab you a cup of coffee or something. And we'll be back here in about three minutes. And we'll get started. out here on this Sunday morning. It's nice and warm already out there for you. It is July, in case you haven't realized that when you step outside. It is July, so the warm weather is here. Go ahead and stand, if you will. We'll grab our hymnals, and we'll turn over to song number 50. Song number 50 in our hymnals here this morning. We'll sing there, Would you be free from the burden of sin? Song number 50 this morning. Ah! 
Praise the Lord for the blood of the Lamb, shed once for all. I'm part of all, amen? Some would say all doesn't mean all. I just figure the Bible means what it says. Because if God pre pre-picked people, he sure wouldn't have picked me. There's a lot better people to pick than me, but you know what? He died once for all. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for, uh, God, just the blessing it is to be uh, together, just the blessing it is, uh, Lord, just to, just to be here knowing that uh, according to your word that you're present where two or more are present and you're with us and we thank you for that. And I pray that, God, you'd work in our midst, uh, Lord, help us, lift us up by your grace. I pray that, Lord, you would uh, fill us with your burden, with your uh, love for people, with your joy, uh, Lord, all those things. And we pray that, God, you'd help us as we sing to, to sing to you and, Lord, to exalt you as we do. And I pray that, Lord, as we open your holy word, that, God, you'd be free to speak and, Lord, that you would just help us, Father, in a great way. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, I uh, want to say thanks to folks who were able to be part of the baby shower. Um, that was a blessing. Some folks went walking for Brother Ben. Thank you for that. That was a blessing. There'll be a, uh, some more opportunities. Get with him and see what we can do to be a help and support uh, in that. And uh, keep, if you will, in prayer uh, these precious ladies that are carrying precious life, amen, just uh, keep them in prayer and uh, hold them hold them dear to the throne of God and, and all that, and I would ask if you wouldn't mind uh, praying for my family, we found out uh, Friday my dad has stage 4 cancer, there's about 3 of them, uh, they're still struggling with some biopsies and stuff, that'll happen tomorrow, um, so I'll be going down there tomorrow and uh, I'll be coming back at some point. Uh, between tomorrow and Sunday. So if you wouldn't mind, especially keeping my stepmom in prayer, um, you know, we just went through all this with my aunt, and she was the uh, she was the primary care person involved in that, and now uh, kind of going there with my dad. So if you wouldn't mind praying for the family, I'd sure appreciate that. Um, and uh, just pray for God's will be done. Amen. All right, we have a special. <clears throat> I 
down that same sinful road. I'd been there many times before, but always walked alone. But one night at an altar, oh, the Master came my way. And if you were to ask me, you would hear me say, this morning and we'll turn over to song number 28 in our hymnal song number 28 here this morning we'll sing there until the day god calls me home 28 my heart can see when i pause to Facebook land or on YouTube land. I think that's all we have right now. 
but say hello to folks and look around, see who's here, say howdy to the folks that are here. It's good to see you all. It's very good to see you all. Um, I did have a friend of mine uh, was out uh, taking tracks. He pastors down south, and he had a he had a Dallas Cowboys mask on. And some folks were giving him a hard time, and I said, man, that's probably the best mask you can have because it won't catch anything, and if, it, if, if you got anything to throw, no one else will catch it. So you're pretty safe there with that Cowboys mask. But uh, anyways, uh, we'll go ahead and sing, wave hello, and say howdy. And as we do, we'll go ahead and have the Junior Church and Children's Church. If you want to go ahead and head on back there with Brother Drake and Miss Lydia there. This morning, let's sing on that third verse. This weary world, with all its toil and struggle, may take its toll of misery and strife. The soul of man is like a
and stand one more time, if you will, here. And we're going to turn it over to song number 485. Song number 485 here this morning. We'll sing there. This world is not my home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Praise the Lord. Someday soon, whatever that word means, I have no idea what it means, but someday soon, the trumpet's going to blow, and in my little happy picture of how all that happens, we'll get to hear the trumpet, in my little happy thing. Yours might be different, that's fine, but we get to hear it, and then we'll go... And then we'll go. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. So someone could transcribe that. Just type it out. That would be awesome. Acts chapter 21 this morning. Acts chapter 21. It... uh... You know, Wednesday, we kind of talked about, we'll begin in verse 17, we kind of talked about how instead of going from moment to moment trying to figure out you know, when all this is going to end or change or whatever, I'm just looking toward January and just figure out what's going to happen and, and whatever. I did read uh, a meme, whatever, and someone asked a doctor, um, when is this disease going to let up? And the doctor said, why are you asking me? I'm a doctor, not a politician. (laughs) I know, sorry, sorry. Why do we say sorry when we don't mean it? I apologize. There we go. Acts 21, verse number 17. Uh, The Bible says, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly, and 
The day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he'd saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? Multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads and All may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up the people and laid hands on them, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they'd seen before with him in the city of Trophimus and an Ephesian whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief, chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word and we just, we pray God that you'd bless the reading of it and, and Lord, as you have Uh, given a message this morning. I just pray for your help, uh, God, for me, uh, Lord, that every word would be uh, a word that glorifies you and that helps us to understand what you're saying. And Lord, that I wouldn't say any words that are uh, oh, that would confuse or, or bring us away from that. And Lord, I pray for every, every ear and every mind and every heart that, Lord, all of us would just allow you to speak and stir and, Lord, just do what you would do in us, Father. We, we need you to do something, God. And I just pray this morning that you would speak to us. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. So we're talking about, as a Christian, are you a bridge of hope or a tripping hazard? That's a, that was like the f- fifth or sixth title. I was trying to Trying to make it as short as possible. I had a paragraph title at the start. I have here a picture that I'll get to in a little bit. I'm absolutely 100% positive that I, I, I don't even know if Zach and Rob can see it, but it's okay. It's, it's a prop and it looks good. Amen. Um, so God holds us Christians to a very high standard. And we see that in Scripture, and it's laid out pretty clear in Scripture. God holds us to a very high standard. The world either ignores us or persecutes us Christians. We hold ourselves to a very low standard. I'm not necessarily talking about you as an individual. I'm talking about Christianity in general. We hold ourselves to a very low, low standard. God holds us to a very high standard. Standard. So, so there's a there's a problem in there where the two ends aren't meeting, right? And and truth is what bridges that. And truth is what if we grab a hold of it and let it grab a hold of us. Truth is what allows us to span that that chasm that's there between those two things. God holds us to a high standard. We hold ourselves to a low standard. We do, however, hold everyone else to a super high standard, (laughs) just not necessarily ourselves. So just a couple questions for you this morning. What are you living for? That'd be crickets. What 
are you living for? What do you want out of life? What do you want for those that are coming behind you? I'm talking about time-wise, not on the sidewalk, although the application could sure be made. But I'm 52, I've got children, grandchildren, people younger. What do I want for them? that I can have a part of. What, what do you want for yourself? What do you want? What are you living for? What do you want out of life? What do you want for those behind you? Remember this, <clears throat> salvation is a gift. It costs you nothing. It costs God everything. God wants us to live for him, which will cost us just not as much as what it cost him. But Paul, remember... From the last time we were in Acts, Paul uh, was there. He was meeting with the elders at Ephesus, and he was headed to Jerusalem, and they were telling him, please don't go, please don't go, please don't go. They're going to kill you there. And Paul says, I'm ready. I'm ready. I I don't even hold my life dear because I'm ready. I I want to go and honor the Lord with whatever happens. So Paul was willing and ready to go die for Jesus, and ultimately that's what's going to happen. So, hopefully we can put some things in perspective for anyone who will listen. Remember Wednesday night we talked about anger. You do not need to live imprisoned by your anger. And the people that you love don't need to live imprisoned by your anger. Well, you also don't need to live as a prisoner to to your own narcissism or pride or arrogancy. You don't need to live as a prisoner for that. And the people you love don't need to live as a prisoner to your narcissism and, and whatever. And I'll explain that as we, as we move along. Uh, but I think that's a good, a good thing to think about. God, well, Jesus Christ died on a cross, shed his blood. When you come to him for salvation, you are literally made free. So Jesus died so that you could be free. Not imprisoned by your thought process or your emotions. In this case, Wednesday we talked about anger and today we're talking about uh, narcissism. Just pride and arrogancy and everything's about me. We live in a very narcissistic, self-centered world. If you don't believe me, look at the news for 11 seconds and you will find plenty of evidence for that statement right there. That's, That's just... Uh, a general, sweeping generalization, and of course we don't ever want to categorize people according to sweeping generalizations, but you look at our culture, our society, our nation, and everything's about me, 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 me. And it, that is not a good place to be. We put ourselves first and care only about what's in our best interest. I'm not Again, not talking about you as an individual necessarily. I'm just talking about as, as a characterization of our culture. And certainly we could say, well, they do the same thing in England and in Spain. Well, that's fine. I'm, I'm here in Wichita. So, so I just want to talk about our own living room and our own street. And, and we do struggle with this, putting ourselves first and caring about what's in our best interest. Too many people live their life with the attitude that it's all about me. And, and I'm, most, I'm only talking about Christians Jesus did not die so that you could be in charge. He died so you could be forgiven. Think about that for a second. Often we live as if he died so I could be in charge. No, he died so you could be forgiven. That means that your sin debt was huge. Not only did he not die to put you in charge, without him dying you had no hope. Lost. In darkness, but because of Jesus, you have new life. Your sin was pretty significant. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, Paul says that Christians should seek the good of others rather than the good of ourself. That is, that is, a, that is a character that's so foreign to the way that people on earth think nowadays. And I'm not saying there's not exceptions, please understand. But if you look at what's going on and and you see where we're headed, 
It, 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 we're not headed to better. Does that make sense? We're not headed to better. If what's going on right now is going to affect a change in our society and our culture, it's not going to be better when this change takes place. It's going to be worse. And, and honestly, if you, if you see some of the demands of the special interests and all these things, the demands, if you look at them in 2020, the demands are the exact opposite of what the demands were in 1960. It's bizarre. I mean, thousands of people died in the fight for equality so we wouldn't have segregation anymore. And now people are killing other people so we can have segregation again. It, it's like crazy, literally crazy. But that's what God says things will be. They'll be crazy. They, they'll believe a lie. They'll fall for a delusion. I, I mean, literally, that, we're living scripture right now as we look at the news. So here's a question. What is one thing you can do for someone else? What is one thing you can do for someone else? A while back, I preached a, a sermon, and, and the question was this. What, what are your contract negotiations with God? What are you willing to do for Jesus? That's an easy question. The harder one is, what are you not willing to do for Jesus? That's the question that really matters. And, and those are things that need to be examined inside our own hearts and inside our own minds. Am I not willing to do this for Jesus? What, what am I unwilling uh, to do? Put yourself in an inconvenience and serve someone else. Do something for someone. Or are you a prisoner of your own narcissism? That is a question that bears to be examined. If I can't do something for someone else, then guess what? I am a prisoner to my own narcissism. And that is not what Jesus died for. Jesus died to set me free from that. So in Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, Paul says it'd be better not to eat meat than to let your brother fall. And Paul says this fully admitting that there's nothing wrong with eating meat. And all God's people said, well, most of God's people said, yeah, there's a few of you. Uh -huh. <laughs> One of my favorite Bible stories is the sheet. Amen. Because I love bacon. There's just something about bacon. Amen. Bacon's good stuff. Christians have proven throughout history to be the most patient, the most kind and loving, giving and compassionate, selfless and honorable, brave, courageous, helpful people on the planet. Christians have proven that throughout history. When you look at history and you see who it was that came to the rescue of different peoples it was christians who were there christians who were there in times of of hardship christians that were there in times of crisis christians that were there in all kinds of situations and do you know uh, so a long time ago in 2000 i think uh, we finished writing what's called the operations plan every municipality has one um, City of Wichita, Sedgwick County, they, they have an O plan that everyone operates on and what to do in the event of a, a, of a crisis or a natural disaster or another kind of disaster or whatever. So there's this kind of flowing, you know, if it's a little disaster, it's just these people. If it's bigger, then it's these people. If it's bigger, it's these people. And, and I don't know if Rob was ever part of any of those tabletop exercises, but those were always fun. Because you get arguments across the table. No, that's our jurisdiction. That's why you have an O plan, an operations plan. Um, <clears throat> so in, in writing this O plan, who's going to do what and when and where, do you know that no matter what the circumstance is, do you know where FEMA goes to, to make sure they have food and, and storage and all that stuff? And now, I'm not kidding you. This is in the O plan, most O plans in, in the United States. The Baptist church. That's what it says. 
It doesn't say the Lutheran church. It says the Baptist church. You know why the Baptist church? Number one, because we're the most giving group of people on the planet. Number two, we pretty much always have a kitchen. (laughs) Number three, we pretty much always got some food stock somewhere (laughs) and whatever. But I'm not kidding you. FEMA, you know, this is a federal thing. They go to the Baptist church. And they'll find Baptist churches in the areas of disaster hurricanes. And I, I mean, I can point you to, to specific churches that were singled out during these times of crisis. If some of you remember, some of us went to Joplin after that tornado. Where'd we go? We went to that big Baptist church on, on the south end of town. And, and uh, I mean, it's just, that's what goes on. You know why? Because Christians historically have proven themselves to be the most giving and humble and serving people on the planet. But Christians are sometimes the most inhospitable people you could ever meet. Christians are sometimes remarkably selfish, judgmental, whiny. And I made up some theological words for you here. Because every time I wrote it, it tried to correct it. Gripey. And blamey. Theological words. Sometimes Christians are the most selfish, judgmental, whiny, gripey, blamey people there are sometimes. That's probably a true statement throughout history. But I think the percentage is changing. Say from the 1300s to today. Look at verse 23. Well, look at verse 17. When we were come to Jerusalem, this is Paul's third missionary journey. It's coming to an end. All right, so this is the tail end of his third missionary journey. And then he ends up, he has to go to Rome and, and whatever. But anyway, so he comes to Jerusalem. And the day following, went with us to see James. This is Jesus' brother. He's pastored the church of Jerusalem there. And all the elders were present. When he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So this is probably a four and a half to six year journey somewhere in that general vicinity. Because he spent three years at Ephesus and he spent some time at Corinth and and whatever. So uh, some take it all the way up to maybe about nine years on this third journey and and whatever. I mean, you can't really tell exactly how long, but... But you take Ephesus, and if this was the 18-month time at Corinth, then that's, that's four and a half years right there. So now you're up probably closer to the eight or nine-year time frame on this third journey. So what, he, what he's doing is rehearsing all the stuff that happened. And there's some exciting things that happened. And there's some letters that were written. And, uh, of course, he's going to, to prison, so he's getting ready to write some more. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, just he's rehearsing this to his home church or to the, to the home church at Jerusalem. He left Antioch and was, uh, was there and just trying to be a, a help and a blessing. He had an offering with him and he delivered that. And so here he is now. He's, he's telling them what's going on. And I mean, it's exciting news, man. I was over in this town and, and, and not only did we see a few people saved, man, we started a church and I'm telling you, things changed. First, they wanted to, everybody wanted me dead. And next thing you know, when I leave, there's there's a hundred people in this church there, and I, I mean, he just he got to tell that story uh, about city after city after city, and and what a what a what a exciting thing to listen to, amen. I mean, can you imagine being the the elders or James sitting there listening to what God was doing? Because I'm telling you, the things in Jerusalem were not good. The things in Jerusalem were lousy, and it's exciting to hear someone saying something about God's really working, because. What we're going to find out is that, uh, you know, people are still getting saved and praise the Lord for that. But boy, it's just, it's just a mess there in Jerusalem. The whole, the whole setting is a mess. And so we, we get our, our way to verse 19. God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Verse 20, when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. Yay. And said unto him, thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the law. So, this is, this is I'm just going to throw some assumptions in here, but I think they're pretty, pretty strong ones. 
there were conversations that were had. I can't wait till Paul gets here. Uh, I don't know. Brother Paul can help us. Preacher, what do we need? What are we gonna do about this thing? I I don't know. Paul's Paul's gonna be here in about a month. We just gotta hang on. <laughs> I, I mean, it seems like some of these conversations were going on. Because Paul tells them what takes place in the last nine years, and they're like, oh, that's awesome. Okay, listen. <laughs> it, I mean, that, that's what happened. That's um, verse 20, if you, if you want to say it maybe this way, that's one of the saddest verses in all the Bible. Because <laughs> Paul just finished telling them what amazing things God's done over the last nine years. And they're like, oh, okay, that's nice. Um, thou seest, brother... How many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the law. They're informed of thee. In other words, people are telling them things about you, that thou teachest all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. So, the, the letter written to the church at Galatia Kind of the same sort of thing going on here at Jerusalem. There's a works salvation, and you have to abide by these works, and these Jews that are getting saved, and praise the Lord for that. But, but after he does all of this stuff, telling him all the great things that God's done, just right there, it's like, oh, that's nice. Listen, we got to talk. I mean, it's like, wow. Not even a day to celebrate. It's, we're going right into it. And it's, it, it's kind of strange what where they head with this because we're not told what's going on in Jerusalem other than the fact that, I mean, they were, they were very destitute poor and they were struggling um, a lot. But praise the Lord, there's folks getting saved. So verse 21, they're informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the custom. What is it therefore? The, the multitude must needs come together. For they will hear that thou art come. So there seems to be a little bit of desperation, maybe some frustration. And, and he's just, he's really hoping that God's going to use Paul to fix this. Verse 23. Do therefore this that we say to thee. Paul, we need you to do something for us. We need you to do something for us. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing. But that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. I want to read something that Thomas Howes wrote back in 1800 on this passage. It's a little bit long, but, but I want you to listen. Hardly had Paul's glowing words of passionate love to Christ, his plea for a free pulpit, as it were, a common Christianity, ceased when James cuts in severely and dryly enough with what he has heard, and then as every word fell like an ice drop on Paul's fervent spirit, and he was wondering whether humiliation could go any further, he had to listen to the crowning proposal that he should take four beggars who had a vow, pay for them himself, and see to their head shaving, etc., before all the people. Paul, who had taught throughout Asia that such usages were foolish and indifferent, was to go nigh eating his own words to ally the fears and gratify the narrow minds of those who called themselves Christ's disciples. The burning question, in fact, in Jerusalem seemed to be not the love of Christ or the conversion of the heathen or fellowship between Christian teachers, but how to keep in with the orthodox laity, how to stand firm by the old organization. It was an awful moment. The fate of his Gentile churches seemed hanging in the balance, but the grandeur of Paul's mission prevailed. At all costs, this rupture between him and the apostles must not take place, And of all places in the world, not at Jerusalem. The party of the church must be saved somehow. 
The aegis of those who had seen the Lord must be spread over the Gentiles. Paul rose to the occasion. Statesman, diplomat, man of ideas, man of action, man of heart. Where shall we find such qualities combined? They meet in Paul. Concession and consistency for one moment seemed at war within him. But with a flash of true spiritual genius, he harmonized them by appealing to the principle higher than either, charity. That divine formula enabled him now, not for the first time and not for the last time, to stoop to conquer. Paul accepts. He appears in the temple. He is at charges with four beggars. He keeps the law of Moses. That's what this guy said about this passage. I think it's brilliant what he said. I mean, here's, here's this situation. Paul's excited about what God has done. They're not excited at all because they got an issue that needs to be taken care of. And Paul's part of that issue because as the letters were sent and whatever people were, were anticipating the coming of Paul, and some of them were a little bit annoyed because of what they'd heard about Paul. There were people all over the world that hated Paul. Uh, boy, you got to work really hard to get that type of, of reputation. So in verse 23... Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them, take, and purify thyself with them. Be at charges with them. That means you pay for everything. They're your charges. Um, That they may shave their heads, and all may know that these things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing. So all this stuff that they've heard, I want them to say, oh goodness, that's nothing. Because I want you to return to the exercising of the law. And so he's taken this. You know, they have the permanent Nazarite vows, they have the temporary Nazarite vows that were for some purpose. There's four guys there that are doing it. They ask Paul to do it with them and to go to the temple so that everybody can see. In other words, look, I want you to make a spectacle of yourself. I want everyone to look so that they can see you're not this heathen that's coming and trying to tear people away from truth. In fact, you are one who will gladly submit to truth. And so this is coming from James, the brother of our Savior. This is coming from uh, the the elders of the church there at Jerusalem. This is coming from whatever division was caused in the church at the time. The poverty, all those things going on. And here they've laid this charge on the apostle Paul. And I'm telling you, Paul had every right to say no. Every right to say no. He had just come from his third arduous, painful, death-defying missionary journey. Think of what he'd been through. His personal cost for the gospel Preaching and teaching, helping and praying, making tents, floating in the water, praying through the storms, being hunted, arrested, beaten. What had all these people done? Nothing. They sat there the whole time I was traveling and risking my life. And they're accusing me of what? Seriously. There is no way I'm going to take upon me the yoke of the law again. He had every right to say no. But he didn't. He put the comfort and needs of others above his own comfort and liberty. Sounds kind of like the teachings of Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Verse 25 As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves. So he's trying to somewhat explain, but there's this nationalistic issue here. The Gentiles don't belong. It may be racist, it may be whatever, but, but ultimately it's that we belong and they don't. And there's this rift there in the church. Many are accusing Paul, look at verse 20, when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. So there's many folks accusing Paul. Obviously, Jesus' brother James is trying to figure out how to help these newly saved people, unfortunately, racist people. So he asked Paul... And this had to, it seems like it had to have been a plan. If this is what happened, if, if there's not 13 pages between, you know, verse 19 and 20, if this is what happened, they had to have already had a conversation. This is what we're going to do. Because I can't figure it out. I've been trying. 
We've, we've, been, we've been killing ourselves trying to get these people to see truth. And, and while we're trying to get them fed, while we're trying to protect them from the persecution, while we're trying to help them to see the love of Christ, and it just seems like things are falling apart more and more and more. I'm telling you, I believe that when the Apostle Paul gets here, uh, God will show him what, what needs to be done. I, I just feel like they had to have had some deep conversation and they put an awful lot of faith in the Apostle Paul. And, and the Apostle Paul, hallelujah, I guess we could say rose to the occasion. He could have said, no, I ain't doing that. That's crazy. Why would we, why would we do that? That's going backwards. Why would we do that? They're accusing Paul... James is trying to figure out how, how to help there. So he asked Paul and asked him to give up all of his liberty to help these new folks out. And he does. How much liberty are you willing to give up? How much liberty are you willing to give up for someone else? That's a question I, I feel like we don't ask ourselves enough. How much liberty am I willing to give up for this person or people I don't know or whatever? How much? Anything, some? Is your liberty a higher virtue than Paul's example of sacrifice? What about Jesus' example of sacrifice? Paul sees the struggle the church at Jerusalem has been under, the weight carried by James, and the Jews hate the Christians and want them dead, and all these things going on. Verse 27, he gets arrested, Paul is beaten, chained, and the rest of the story comes out next week. But Paul suffered all of this for the cause of Christ and for the help and hope of those struggling Christians in Jerusalem. He put others first. He divested himself of his liberty and did not allow it to become a prison. I'm going to read a couple passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9. The Bible says, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5 verse 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Are you a bridge to hope? Think about that for a moment. Bridges connect to unconnected things. Bridges span a space, they span a height, they span a distance and an obstacle. There are songs written about bridges, there are movies written about bridges, there are books written about bridges, poems written about bridges. Bridges are made from stone and wood and concrete and steel. There's a slide somewhere coming Right there. <clears throat> what you see here is the Golden Gate Bridge. And I don't think you can see it. Maybe you can. But right there where that white thing's pointing, that's called the Golden Gate. There's a bridge that goes over the Golden Gate. The Golden Gate is that, that little jetty that opens up between two peninsulas that allows that area of San Francisco to be navigated by, by ship. So right, right here is where the Golden Gate Bridge is. So if you're right here and you need to get over here, you would had to have got on a boat and floated over there because you can't. It was not practical to drive over here. So they had boats. Well, the boats were replaced eventually by a bridge. In 1933, they started building the bridge. 1937, it opened. And at the time, it was the world's longest uh, suspension bridge at the time. Are you a bridge to hope? 
The Golden Gate Bridge, it's almost 9,000 feet long. The main span over the water is 4,200 feet long, close to a mile. So at the time in 1937, it was the longest suspension bridge. Now it's the 17th longest suspension bridge. The bridge connects those two parts of land right there. So that people can drive from one side to the other. I got fascinated with the Golden Gate Bridge when I had to take a trip there in the military. We flew into um, San Francisco and then we drove up Highway 1 to Sacramento. Um, and it was just a, we spent some time at the Golden Gate Bridge and and, of course, you go in and read all this stuff. It's pretty fascinating, uh, the tr struggle, the engineering struggles they went through uh, because there wasn't a suspension bridge anywhere close to the size of this thing. <laughs> and pretty fascinating uh, stuff. But this bridge, just like all other bridges, are made out of stone or wood or concrete or steel if you're talking about you as an individual, you're made out of the stuff of the earth. You know what's interesting about bridges? They connect two unconnected things. They get you over obstacles, around obstacles. They do all kinds of stuff. They allow things to go under the shipping lane that goes through there. It's pretty remarkably busy. They build bridges over train tracks so you, the train can keep going and the cars don't have to stop and all kinds of stuff. But you know what makes a bridge work? They get walked on or driven over. I wonder how many Christians are just absolutely not willing to get walked on or driven over. I'm not saying we should be a doormat. We ought to be strong in the Lord. Be willing to fight, but also be willing to be a bridge to hope divest ourselves of some liberty so that others can be helped. Liberty is not the greatest Christian virtue. Humility is. For some reason, it seems like in 2020 that liberty has become the greatest Christian virtue. Those same materials, wood and stone and concrete and steel, they can be a bridge like, like this bridge here. They can be made into a bridge that spans this huge ocean there and whatever. They can be that or they can be a tripping hazard. Same material. So just like you are made out of things of the earth and born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, you can be a bridge to hope or you can be a tripping hazard for someone else. Ecclesiastes tells us everything we do, everything we think, everything we say is either good or evil. Those are the only two categories, good or evil. And sometimes I think it would be good, I mean I, I can show you in scripture, for us to humble ourselves enough to maybe be a bridge. Get walked on so others can go further. So they can get to the part that without us they can't get to. Because we're the bridge. Paul did an absolutely just crazy thing here. And, and really James asked him to do a crazy thing. You know what's amazing about that story, though? I don't think James had a single doubt in his heart about Paul's response. 
I think there was enough known about the character of his friend Paul. He knew he was asking a hard thing, but he knew he was asking a thing that Paul could do. What a great testimony. You can be a bridge for someone to bring them to Christ or as a new Christian you can bring them along to hope or you can be a tripping hazard for someone on that same path. What are you willing to do outside of your comfort zone, outside of your serving self? What are you willing to do for Christ? There's no, there's no way to serve Christ. Do, do you get that? You have to serve someone. <laughs> you can't bring Jesus a cup of coffee. It's not possible. But you can serve people, his, his people and all those created in his image. That's how we serve Christ. Would you ask the Lord for some help? And this week, would you just determine, I mean, just as a little stepping stone, would you ask the Lord for wisdom and do something for someone this week? Maybe divest a little bit of liberty so that someone else can be helped. So that the cause of Christ can be furthered. So that the gospel can go forth. God, we love you and we thank you for time together in your word. And Lord, I <clears throat> pray for help for me, for all of us, Lord. We, we certainly get twisted sometimes and we get awful self-centered. Lord, I pray for help. God, that you would show us ways that we can serve. Show us things that we can do to be a help, to be an encouragement, to be a blessing, to build a bridge of hope, Lord, for those that are just new Christians that, that need to see us living out the fruit of the Spirit. They need to see us truly living out what it means to be a Christian. God, help us. Forgive us for our pride and arrogance and self-centeredness and narcissism. Just forgive us and take that away from us, Lord, that that would never be named among us again. And help us, Lord, to bring honor and glory to your name. Pray, bless these few minutes. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? <clears throat> As the musicians play, would you spend a moment with the Lord? That throne of grace, what a beautiful, beautiful thing. The throne of grace. One day it will become a throne of judgment. Right now it's a throne of grace. Would you spend a moment with the Lord tonight? Ask Him, Lord... I'm really struggling. All I think about is myself. Maybe that's what you need to bring to the throne. Maybe, maybe God's stirring your passions and you're ready to just invest in someone or serve someone. Would you just come and ask him what he'd have you to do? I invite you to take your hymnal, turn to song 39. Sing along there. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Song number 39.
We'll sing one more verse this morning. If no one comes, we'll close the invitation. One more verse. it is to be together and I pray that Father you would help us Lord I pray for all those that were able to join us online that God you would help all of us Lord just stir our hearts and God show us um, show us how we can serve you better uh, Lord help us to not be a prisoner to our pride but Lord that we really would be a bridge of hope Lord for those around us we love you Lord Thank you for this time together. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Go and be seated real quick. Um, <clears throat> so August 4th. Does anybody know what August 4th is? Hey, good job. It's probably other things, but, but it's its primary election. There's, there's every district. So, I mean, we don't live in the same districts. So I, um, I, you know, there's, there's six city council members, I think. Is that right? I think there's six, right? And uh, and as far as like state house, there's in the city of Wichita, there's probably ten or fifteen in the city of Wichita, somewhere like Sagan in the county. So <clears throat> so every person kind of lives in a different well district, and then of course smaller than that, you have precincts. Um, but August fourth is the primary, so all of you are going to have a primary. Because um, we have the state senate, I mean the federal senate, and some other things, and county commissions, so both of those will be on your, um, not county commission, but the, well yeah, county commission, but the um, county treasurer, um, that'll be countywide. Um, it, so it's, it's, it's a really important election. Uh, primaries don't get as much turnout as the... Um, generals, um, one of the things that I have seen, um, there, there's a lot of folks that refuse to wear this thing anywhere, and I mean, ultimately, that, that's between you and the Lord, but percentage-wise, it's probably 95% of what might be considered conservative people are not willing to wear this, which means they're not going to vote. In the primary, and guess what? I can promise you, we'll still have to wear this in the general. It's not going to affect the liberals at all, not one bit. So I want to urge you God created three institutions, and this is the order that He created them in family, government, church. If you want to go with orders, that's the order that he created those in. So um, it is super important that we engage in what God created. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of that. And August 4th, a very important um, election. You, you might do the mail-in thing or whatever. I think Cindy and I are going to vote early, but we're not doing the mail-in thing because I am i don't trust that. But... <clears throat> But uh, you can vote early, starting whenever, and uh, so we'll be we'll be doing that. Um, when does that start? The where you can go vote early. Twentieth. I was thinking it's like twenty third, but twentieth. So so keep that in mind. And August fourth, um, vote. And if you're a registered Democrat, vote often. But you know, how do we know who to vote for? Well, my num my litmus test is is life, and that settles ninety five percent of all, maybe ninety eight percent of all things. E even among conservative candidates, it still settles most of those. So, 
where, where does a person land on life? That settles it for me. Um, and then beyond that, I have some other litmus test things. I have, I have a total of six. I've never made it past three, um, which praise the Lord for that. But um, anyways, figure out, you know, what you're, what you're voting for and why. I'm not telling you how to do that, but life is a good place to start. Um, you know, we're created in God's image and, and that applies to every everyone. So that's going on August 4th. And then please keep Lori's dad in prayer. How's, how's he doing? What's going on with him right now? Okay. Are they going to do biopsies or just MRI? Okay. Okay. So keep, keep him in prayer. Keep my family in prayer if you would. And then Robert Freeman, um, the uh, man from the Air Force that's been coming, he tested positive for COVID. Um, so that's kind of where he's been. Please keep him in prayer. And if you have any way to do so, reach out to him. Um, if you have any contact information, he is on Facebook. Um, but keep him in prayer if you would. And, and others, I know all of us know someone, so keep each other in prayer. Praise the Lord that, that this strain is not largely debilitating people, so praise the Lord for that, mostly. Um, so that is a blessing, but um, just keep each other in prayer uh, for that. So that's about all that I know. Um, we'll go ahead at this time and receive the offering. We have plates in the back and plates up front. And you can get on your mobile device and give through Tithely. Go to our website and give there. But we'll go ahead and receive the offering. God, we thank you for your amazing love for us, your long-suffering, just, uh, God, how you continue to work in our lives. And I pray that, Lord, you'd bless this offering. Um, God, there's much going on. Our needs are getting bigger and greater. And just pray for help and wisdom. Pray that, God, you'd bless this offering, magnify it. Lord, for your glory, uh, we love you in the name of of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, we'll go ahead and stand and we will be sent off in a verse of song. We'll see you back this evening. Um, looking forward, pressing on with the uh, um, reconnect and kind of morphing that into a, a different thing tonight, but uh, looking forward to tonight. So yeah, Friday is when you can start advance voting by mail, and when we say that, there's plenty of options. If you don't want to stick it in a mail box, they are actually going to have uh, secured. Um, I was going to say boxes, but that's not that's probably not the best word. But secured uh, boxes, for lack of a better word, set up at the election office where you can actually drive and just stick it in there. And they're going to be picking those up pretty consistently throughout the day. So you can do that pretty simple. Um, each one of the election officers has actually received, re received training from the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security concerning how to test for signatures and such on all applications there. And so they will have probably a large amount, could have a larger amount of um, contested ones. So, And then advanced voting in person, it is the 20th um, there that you can... I say that, and then I think I read, still read that wrong. Um, let me look here real quick. I had it pulled up, sorry. Um, advanced voting in person at the election office begins on the 20th there, and then satellite offices will be open on July 30th for voting. So right now, um, there's, there's a fun way to get involved. Um, the polling places are you know, traditionally, historically, um, 
operated by, I mean, pretty much you had to be 80 in order to, to work at the polling place. Basically, I mean, that's just how it is. Well, I mean, the, the recommendation is that older folks don't go at all. So what we have right now is a, a enormous shortage of people to work the polling places, which means they're going to have to shut down polling places. I mean, our, our place already changed, uh, so it may change again. But I want to encourage you, all you have to do is call the election office and say, I'm willing to work, and they'll pay you for the training, and they'll pay you for the day that you're there. And you're not there very long. You have to be there at like 4.30, is that right? 4.45, and then you get to go home about 7.30 or something. 8, whatever. But, uh, but you do get paid, and you get to see, some, see the election from a different perspective. And, and you have to be 16 um, to work it. I think that's, is that right? 16, yeah, you have to be 16. And, uh, and so that's the limitation. But I encourage you, um, you know, my wife's done it, Jenna's done it. Um, I think, well, this year, Kimber and Jen are doing it, um, but I'd encourage you to get involved. That's a, a neat way to be there, and then you get to see all the chaos sometimes and whatever. But anyways, that's my plug. And I believe you can also sign up for partial day, too, as well. If you don't have time to do 15 hours, I believe they are doing this year. They're looking at doing um, some of that. So. Uh, as you're standing, we'll turn over song number 28. Don't forget here as you go throughout this week, it's hot. It'll wear you out quickly, but don't forget to smile along the way. 2020's word of the day, word of the year, whatever it is, Corona Coaster. It's the ups and downs of living in a pandemic. One day you're loving your bubble, doing workouts, baking banana bread, and going for long walks. The next day you're crying, drinking hand sanitizer for breakfast, and missing people you don't even like. The struggle is definitely real. Song number 28, as we dismiss, let's sing there. What verse did I tell? On that third verse there.